Hello, and welcome to lecture three of the electric potential unit in Phys 1201. And in this lecture, we're going to look at how electric potential and electric field are related to each other. One way of thinking about the meaning of electric potential is that it is the electric potential energy per unit charge that you place at a location. So you have some location, there's no charge there. But if a charge happens to come through and you want to know the potential energy of that charge, then you just get it by taking that charge times the potential at A. And so that's what I mean by V at A being the electric potential energy per unit charge. Is there something similar for gravitational potential energy? Well, you know you can calculate gravitational energy this way. And so that means if there's some location, I'll call it B, and some mass happens to come through, then you can calculate the potential energy of that mass as long as you know the height at B. And so height is quite analogous to electrical potential. That suggests that we can draw some pictures that are similar. We draw pictures of heights the way we do on a topographical map. So here are contour lines like, like you might see on a topographical map. So everywhere on this line, the height of the land is 100 meters, here's the 80 meter line, and so on. And if you're not used to reading topo maps, then let's draw a cross section of this hill so I've put this line through here, and if you picture what a cross section of the hill is like along that line, so I've designated these places A, B, and somewhere way over here C, then you can see that starting from A and walking to B, you go up a long way. And there's the crest of the hill somewhere near B. And now you go down, but it takes you all the way until point C, a long way away to go back down the same distance. And so there's the view of the hill from the side. And so you see where the contour lines are close together, that's a steep hill. And where they're far apart, that's a shallow slope. So we do the same thing with electric potential. We draw what are called equipotential curves. And so this is showing you here's a place where if you walk this way, the potential is changing slowly. And over here, here's a steep slope in the potential. If you walk a short distance here, you get a large change in potential. Let's see how that looks in our simplest case, which is a parallel plate capacitor. So let's say we have a parallel plate capacitor, and suppose we've defined the potential on the negative plate to be zero, and say it turns out that the potential on the positive plate is 50 volts, and the plates are separated by one millimeter. What do, what do the equipotential lines look like in between? Well, we know that the potential is a linear function, like so. And so that means if you go a fifth of the distance across, you will have gone a fifth of the potential difference up. And so the 10 volt equipotential curve is going to be, look, it depends only on x, right? So it doesn't matter where we are in y, it only matters where we are in x. And so there's going to be a vertical line here, say, at a fifth of the distance, so 0.2 millimeters across, and there's going to be another one at 0.4, and at 0.6, and at 0.8, and these are going to be parallel lines where the potentials on these are now 10 volts, 20 volts, 30 volts, 40 volts. And there would be the zero volt line right here and the 50 volt line right up against this plate. One thing we haven't discussed is point charges and how potential and potential energy works for them. In a more advanced course, we would focus on this and then we would derive everything else from it, but that requires calculus, so we can't do that. But here's our situation. 
we have two charges separated by some distance r. We know Coulomb's law tells us the force between them, and that force versus position looks like this. And we also know that a change in potential energy is a negative work done by the electrical force. So think about it. If you start off here, and you push this charge Q in, then you're going to have to push about this hard, right? Not very hard. A small force will do. And your work is going to be something like that force times the distance that you push. And so our potential energy changes out here are small. In other words, this has a small slope. We know it's getting bigger as we move closer in, right? Because if you start these two, let's say they're po both positive charges, and you start them close together and let go of one, then it shoots away, gaining kinetic energy. So potential energy must be high in close and low far away. Now think, if you start somewhere close, and you push in a little bit in here, now you're having to exert a big force to do it. And so that means the potential energy is changing fast in here. And so that suggests that the potential energy versus position graph is a very similar shape to the force versus position. And in fact, the formula comes out quite similar. Here it is. The only difference is that instead of 1 over r squared, this one goes as a 1 over r. But now that means we know how to find the potential around a point charge. If we now think of this one as our source, and this one as our probe, so we're mapping out the potential due to this charge q, then our potential is going to be ue over q prime, right? That's our probe charge. And so that's just kq q prime over r all divided by q prime. And that's just kq over r. Now let's think about what the equipotential curves look like in the vicinity of this charge q. So we know that the potential only depends on radial distance away from it. So the equipotential curves must be circles. We also know that the potential is steep in close, right? It's going to be exactly the same shape as this UE versus R graph, because all we've done is divide out a constant. And so since it's steep in close, that tells us that the equipotential curves are going to be close together there, and they're going to get more and more spaced out as we move farther from the source charge, because the, the slope of the potential versus position is getting smaller out here. Now think about what that means. You know that the field due to this charge is very large in close and very weak when you're looking out far away from it. And that suggests that the, sl the, that the slope is somehow related to the E-field strength. Also, you know that these equipotential curves are going from high, oops, from high in here to low out here. And the E-field is pointing out. The E-field always points from high potential to low potential. So we know that the E-field points from high potential to low potential. And we can say a little bit more than that. Think about if we take a charge and put it here. And now let's say we carry it along the equipotential curve. Well, how much did its potential energy change? 
Well, it didn't change, right? Because the potential energy, the change in the potential energy would just be the charge, Q, times the change in potential. But we went along an equipotential curve. The potential stayed constant at 80 volts. And so that means delta U was zero along this line. But we also know that's equal to the negative work by the electric force. So the electric force must have done no work as we walked along this line. And we know what that means. When a force does no work at all, that means the force is perpendicular to the direction of motion. So the field vectors must be perpendicular to the equipotential curves at all points. And they are strong where the lines are close together and weak where the lines are far apart. To be able to write down an equation that relates the electric field strength to the potential, we're going to go back yet again to the simplest case, which is the parallel plate capacitor. So as we've seen over and over again, the electric field strength inside a parallel plate con uh, capacitor is the same everywhere. And it's given by this expression. And we've also seen that the potential as a function of position inside a capacitor looks like this. It's a straight line graph, with con so it has constant slope. Um, the equipotential curves would look like this. And as I pointed out rather cryptically at the end of lecture two, the E field strength actually appears right here in the potential versus position function. It's in fact the slope of the straight line. And that is the general relationship. It's easiest to see in a parallel plate capacitor because the E field is the same everywhere. But this, in fact, applies no matter what you look at. The E field strength is just the slope of the potential versus position graph. Let's use what we've just learned to find the field here at A. We know that it's perpendicular to the equipotential curve, and we know it points from high potential to low potential. So at this point, it must point down here in the negative y direction. All that's left is to find its strength, and that is the slope of v versus, and I'll write delta y because we're going in the y direction here. Well, look, in a distance of four centimeters here, there's a 200 volt drop. And so there we have it. It's 200 volts over 0 0.04 meters, right? And so that is 50,000 volts per meter. And so the only thing to now notice is that's not the units we've seen before, but a volt is a joule per coulomb and a joule is a newton meter. And the meters cancel, and we're left with newtons per coulomb, as we expect for an E-field. So volts per meter are also another way of writing the units for an E-field.